Hello! I'm going to be starting Chapter 6, or CT and MRI of the chest. Um, this lecture, will be we'll, we're going to be going over Chapter 6 for the most part. Uh, we'll talk about the general chest anatomy. We will be talking about the mediastinal structures and how they work and where they are. We'll be talking about great vessels and how they work, how does the blood flow work um, in them. We're also going to be talking about the important thoracic muscles and some indications for CT of the chest because I think that's important for you guys to know. So the beginning of the chapter talks about the bony thorax, which is fairly review for everybody. It talks about the 12 ribs. You have the uh, sternum and the different parts of it, manubrium, body, um, the xiphoid process. And then um, it explains a little bit about thoracic inlet and thoracic outlet, which is shown here. This will help us when we look at the CT images and how a CT image would look, would look like in a looking at the thoracic inlet versus thoracic outlet. This is another image. Um, it is a, a sagittal CT reformation of the sternum. This is not done very often, but um, I think your book just wanted to show you what it looks like. Um, this would be one of the first slices that you'll see if you were doing a CT chest. So you are looking at, of course, um, you're looking at the lungs. Here's the right lung. Here's the left lung. You're looking at um, the trachea right there, manubrium, or the top of the sternum is there, and uh, some of the muscles are shown around here. So this will be um, the top of the chest, or what they call a superior thoracic aperture. Now going all the way down, if we make all the slices all the way down to the chest where you're looking at this slice, the end, um, you're looking at the end of the liver, you'll see some of the lungs here. Uh, you're at the T12 vertebrae, so um, this will be um, the inferior thoracic aperture or the very lowest portion of the thoracic cavity. So let's talk about uh, pleural cavities. So we know that each lung lives, uh, lies within a single pleural cavity, and it's lined by a, a membrane that's called pleura. This is a serous membrane. It has serum inside of it. And this is what we mean by a pleural cavity. So this is this inside all the gray area is the pleural cavity. And the white parts are, are your lungs, basically. Here's the right lung over here, and this is the left lung. So the lungs are, yes, inside this pleural cavity, but what about this pleural cavity? Well, the pleural cavity is also divided into two layers. Um, if I can get another color, I can show you these lines a little bit better. So you're looking at um, the pleural cavity, and you're looking at the line that's right here, and I'm making it blue. So that's called parietal pleura. That's the outer layer, parietal pleura, that um, is continuous with the thoracic wall and the diaphragm and moves with these structures when you take a breath. On the other hand, you have the visceral pleura. And I'm going to make that green. So you, the visceral pleura is the inner layer of the pleural cavity right here. So guess what? That inner layer is closely covering the lungs, as you can see on this image. And um, it continues into the fissures to cover individual lobes and all the way down. Uh, so what happens if there's fluid in between inside this uh, pleural cavity? Well, something like this happens. This is a chest x-ray with the pleural effusion. And see how you can see all this fluid inside? This is not inside the lung tissue. It is outside, it's inside uh, the pleural cavity that, that has fluid in it. And this is where we will use some of the ultrasound procedures to take this fluid out by, for example, doing thoracentesis. Uh, so, and then you can see the visceral pleura, this layer, the inside layer, and the outside layer looking, and then there is a space between them which is full of fluid. Okay, well, let's talk about lungs. Well, we know that these are the organs of respiration. We breathe with lungs. Um, they have uh, basically sponge-like material. Um, 
and um, when you look at the lungs, uh, you have the apex of the lung, which is on top, and then you have the base of the lung at the bottom. The right lung is divided into three lobes. The left lung is divided into two lobes. You're looking at the trachea, which is coming down. As it comes down, it divides into two branches or what we call them the right and left main stem bronchus. So you have the right main stem bronchus and the left main stem bronchus dividing and going into each lung. At the division, we have an area called corina. So corina is uh, the area where the trachea divides into two. We also have hilum, what we call a hilum is an opening to the lungs. And why do we have this opening to the lungs? Well, um, if we want to get the trachea to go inside the lungs and we want all the vessels and all the arteries and everything to go into the lungs, we need an opening. And that opening is called hilum. Okay, let's go into... So, for example, this is another um, image that uh, sort of looking at the lungs um, a little bit lower. Uh, this is actually an MRI, a T1 weighted image of the lungs at the hilum. So at the opening um, of um, opening to the lungs, we'll look at the hilum. This is a CT image of the same area. Uh, this also shows the aorta um, and the pulmonary arteries too, which we will go over um, very quickly. This one is good because it shows the left main stem bronchus, the right main stem bronchus, and then the hilum of the right lung, which is the opening. This is a good CT image. It's, um, it, it's looking directly at the carina, which is uh, this bifurcation of uh, the, the Th trachea into the right and left main stem bronchi. Um, this is really showing carina very well. The other structures that I'm really um, concerned about that you need to look at are the esophagus and the trachea, which are shown both here. And we'll go over them um, in just a second when we talk about them. So let's talk about mediastinal structures. Uh, the mediastinum is in basically the midline region of the thoracic cavity, and it's between the two pleural cavities of the lungs. Uh, some of the mediastinal structures, uh, for example, you have the thymus gland, you have the trachea, you have the esophagus. Um, so these are all the mediastinal structures. Um, when we look at CT images, these are the structures that we want to look at. This one again looks at the carina, the right and left main uh, bronchi, and then um, esophagus. Uh, sh it's, sh it's not shown very well, but it's there. This is just another look at the lungs and the right and left um, bronchi when they divide into two. Here you're looking at the mediastinal structures. It's a sagittal view um, of the entire compartment and what structures are in there. Well, look, let's look at the thymus gland, for example. It's triangular shaped. It's um, of a lymphatic tissue. It's on in the superior portion of the mediastinum. It's just behind the manubrium. And the funny thing about thymus gland is you really can't see it in adults. It uh, decreases its size as um, we become adults. So you can see it more prominently in a, in a child CT than, than in an adult. Thymus gland on, is on an axial uh, T1 weighted MR image. This is actually a pediatric uh, chest that shows the thymus gland. T means the thymus gland, obviously. This is also looking at the manubrium and the thymus gland um, that is right there. It's shown the thymus gland right there. Again, looking, 
indicating thymus gland on CT of an adult is, is not very easy. Trachea and esophagus is shown here too. So you're looking at the trachea, which is always open, air field. It has to be open, otherwise your patient can't breathe, and then which is anteriorly, and then you have the esophagus, uh, more posteriorly, it could be open or closed depending on um, when you capture that part of the esophagus. Uh, so these are all part of the mediastinal, are, are the mediastinal structures. Okay. Let's go on the next one. Uh, next one is really showing a lot of veins and the arteries, which we will go into. Um, the main thing for you guys to know is that look at the reference image and look at where that image was coming from. Uh, obviously, we're not into the heart yet. We're above. We're kind of above the carina, uh, but you can see the tr trachea. You can see the esophagus. This is the trachea, this is the esophagus. The trachea is always anterior, esophagus is always posterior to it. Um, these are the c type of structures that I want you to be able to uh, distinguish on these pictures. Here's the same image, a CT, again showing trachea and esophagus. So at this point, we're not at the bifurcation of uh, of trachea yet. We're not at corina. We're not. Uh, we don't see any bifurcation. All we see is the trachea in a solid uh, tube right now. As we go lower and lower, then we can see the bifurcation. Here's another um, CT scan of the trachea and the esophagus. This time, esophagus happens to be open. Right there. Okay, let's talk about the heart and the vasculatures um, of the heart. So, as you know, your heart, oh, look at those little kitties. All right, um, the base of the heart is actually the top of the heart, right? And the apex of the heart is at the bottom. Um, we, you all know that the heart is made of four chambers. We'll go over those chambers um, momentarily, uh, but it also, it's good to know that heart is another um, structure of the mediastinum. So the mediastinal structures are basically the heart, all the great vessels that we'll talk about, trachea, esophagus, and the thymus gland. Heart is a double-layered sac. Um, I'm, so, I'm sorry, it's a, there is a double-layered sac surrounding the heart. The heart is not just a double-layered sac. Uh, but the heart is a muscle that is covered with this sac. The sac is called pericardium or pericardial sac. We said it's double layer. It's basically double layer to cushion the heart. Uh, it actually contains a very small amount of fluid to, again, to cushion the heart. Um, when you look at the walls of the heart, um, b let's not get into the chambers yet, but let's um, let's look at the walls before. Let's go here. So the walls of the heart consist of three layers. You have the epicardium, myocardium, and endocardium, and we'll explain those in a little bit. Uh, the chambers of the heart, you can look here. There's right ventricle, left ventricle, there's left atrium, and then right atrium. Um, here you're looking at, um, hopefully you're, you'll be able to see the three layers of the heart on a CT is not as uh, prominent to see, but basically you have the pericardium and then you have the myocardium here is shown here. Let's see if we can see them better, much better here. Um, so here's the heart that was um, cut in the middle. You're looking at the epicardium. Epicardium is the outside uh, muscle layer of the heart. You have the myocardium, which is the middle layer, the muscular layer. And then the third one, which is the inner layer of the heart. Um, and that's endocardium. I don't know if they showed. Yeah, they showed the endocardium right here. Okay, so the three layers of the heart, the muscles of the heart, you start from the outer layer to inner is epicardium, myocardium, and endocardium. This one is, this 
picture is also good because it shows you the atrium, the right and left atria, and then you have the left ventricle and then the right ventricle. And as you know, the left ventricle is bigger because that is the muscle that pumps the oxygenated blood into the aorta going all the way to the rest of the body. So your the left side of the heart is always bigger, more muscular than the right side. Okay, here's another uh, really great picture um, of the heart. It's an anterior view of the surface of the heart. It still shows uh, the left and right ventricle. Um, you're also looking at the aorta, which is coming from the left side of the heart all the way up, turning into the aortic arch, and then going down to the left, left side of the body, which is not shown here, but it's behind the heart. Okay, this is a really nice picture. It's an axial T1 weighted image um, MRI of the of the chest, and it's showing pretty much the uh, left atrium um, and some of some portions of the right vent ventricle as well. Now let's talk about the valves uh, that are in the heart. And, and those are very important because um, often you'll see you can, when you do an MRI of, uh, of the heart, you can actually see the cardiac valves. Okay, which I think we're going to get into one more image and then we'll be able to see uh, the valves. Perfect, right here. Uh, so there are four valves that are located in the heart. They function to maintain the one-way direction of the blood. Imagine if these valves didn't, were not working properly. Well, the blood would not flow in one way, and then you will get deoxygenated blood mixed up with oxygenated blood, and that would be bad. So um, you have some of the valves that are in between the atrias and the ventricles. Um, and we'll go over some of those valves first. So um, let's look at, and they're called atrioventricular valves, right? Atrioventricular meaning between the atrium and the ventricle. Between the right, so if you're looking at the right atrium, this is it. This is the right atrium and this is the right ventricle. There's a valve right there that I'm going to make. Maybe we'll make the valves red. Um, that's right there. This valve is called the right atrioventricular valve, as another name for it is tricuspid valve. Okay, so if we look at now the left side of the heart, the left ventricle and the left atrium, there's also another valve. It's also the left atrioventricular valve or bicuspid or mitral valve. So these are important to know. These are really um, structures of the heart that we all need to know. Okay. This also, this picture is really good because it, it, it shows the blood flow and it, how it goes from the left side of the heart, how it goes from the left side of the heart. It comes from the pulmonary veins and it goes to the left ventricle. It gets pumped out into the tr um, aorta. This is the ascending aorta. Then you ha you've got the aortic arch and then descending aorta coming down. Well, let's look at the blood flow through the heart, right? So you have the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. Those are the deox uh, those are the deoxygenated blood. Those are the blood that come from uh, the structures of your body. They need to go to the lungs to get oxygenated. Therefore, they go to the right atrium. They go to the tricuspid valve. They go to the right ventricle. Then they go to the pulmonary semilunar valve and then pulmonary arteries and then the lungs to get oxygenated. On the other hand, you have the right and left pulmonary veins that come from the lungs. They have oxygenated blood. They go to the left atrium, then through the mitral valve, then to the left ventricle. Um, they go to the aortic semilunar valve, and then ascending aorta, aortic arch, and then descending aorta. So these two are basically the top one is talking about the deoxygenated blood flow and the lower one talks about oxygenated blood flow which are really really important all of these structures and the valves are important for you to know let's talk about the great vessels and what we looked at 
when the vessels were coming out of the aortic arch. So you basically have three major vessels coming out of the aortic arch. There's the brachiocephalic artery, which turns into the right common carotid artery, and then in turn, that artery itself turns into the right internal and external carotid arteries. You have the brachiocephalic artery, which turns into the right subclavian, and then in turn, it becomes right vertebral. You have the left common carotid artery, which turns into the left internal and then external carotid artery. And then the left subclavian turns into the left vertebral artery. So you're looking at that aortic arch that we were just talking about, and these are the three major vessels that I mentioned first. So you have the brachiocephalic trunk, you have the left common carotid artery, and then left subclavian artery. These are the three main branches coming out from the aortic arch. Brachiocephalic trunk, left common carotid artery, and then left subclavian artery. Here you're looking at actually posterior view of the heart, which is really um, I, I know I think it's is very useful to look at posterior view. We don't see this view as much unless we do cath lab. So this again is the aortic arch. This is ascending aortic arch and then descending aorta. Like I said, how it goes down towards the left side of the body and then carries the oxygenated blood to the rest. So you have the brachiocephalic trunk, you have the left common carotid artery, and then left subclavian artery. Oh, so to prevent a heart attack, take one aspirin every day, take it out for a run, take it to the gym, and take it for a bike ride. I thought that was funny. Okay, let's look at more CT images with actually these um, um, great vessels coming out of the aorta and see what we can find out. So the first thing you want to look at is the reference image and see where the line is going through. So the line looks like it's... Um, after the uh, sort of at the bifurcation of the um, trachea where you can actually see the carina of the trachea um, getting bifurcated right there right you can see the esophagus right there and then descending aorta ascending aorta so you can't really see the aortic arch because you probably passed it you're a little bit inferior towards uh, the aortic arch, but you can see the descending and then the ascending aorta, both shown here. Again, uh, this is um, at the bifurcation where you're looking at the carina again. These are the two um, branches of the trachea going down into the lungs, and then you see the descending aorta and then the ascending aorta. This uh, is a little bit lower, as you can see, so the bifurcation is gone. You really can't see, um, uh, you can see the right main stem bronchus, but you can't really see the left one that, that well. Um, you're looking at the pulmonary trunk. This is really an important image because this is where you often see uh, pulmonary embolism because you're looking at the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary vessels. Esophagus is also shown here, which is really important, and then we'll talk about the rest of them as we go. Again, pulmonary trunk, very, very important. This is a, this looks like a CTA, it looks like they injected contrast, they're looking at the pulmonary trunk to see if there's a pulmonary um, uh, emboli or anything uh, wrong with the pulmonary uh, trunk. Descending, ascending, you have the right and left main bronchi, and then um, it also shows the azygous vein, which we will talk about in just a second. This is a sagittal view um, of the chest in an MRI. Here again, we're looking at the, the great vessels and how, um, as they go up, for example, the brachiocephalic trunk that we talked about turns into the right common carotid and then the right subclavian artery.
This is a CTA of the same area. When you do CTAs and you do uh, reconstruction, uh, this is how uh, you'll actually see it. You'll see the vessels very bright with the uh, contrast in them, and it looks really neat. This is another CTA of the same area, looking at the, the branches of the aortic arch. Again, another one, um, it's actually looking at um, the subclavian artery, the left common, and then again, brachiocephalic trunk that turns into right common carotid artery and the right subclavian artery. Looking at an axial image of those arteries going up uh, towards the neck. Oh, before you run out of the class, let me tell you a little bit more. Now, a zygous uh, venous system, that was the one that I said I was going to talk about. Basically, the azygous venous system provides collateral circulation between the inferior and superior vena cava. Uh, you can divide them into azygous and hemiazygous veins, and um, they're shown here. The azygous vein is this one. And... Um, Let's see, the hemiozygous vein is inferior to that, which is this one. So basically what they're doing is they're helping with the venous um, drainage of the superior and inferior vena cava, and they're connecting them together. Now, believe it or not, you can actually see a zygous and hemiozygous veins on a CT or MRI. This is an MRI, but you can see the hemiozygous and an azygous. It's important to know the location of them. So what can you tell from just looking at this? Well, a zygous is more towards the right side of the body. Hemiozygous is more towards the left side of the body. A zygous is more anterior, and hemiozygous is more posterior. Here again, a zygous and hemiozygous. This is in a CT. Very hard to see, but they're still um, identifiable. So again, a zygous is more towards the left side of the, I'm sorry, a zygous is more towards the right side, and hemiozygous is more towards the left side, as you can see. Okay. Next, we'll be talking about thoracic muscles. You notice in your book that I missed or I... Uh, jumped around a lot because your book provides a lot of the uh, pictures of the heart, uh, muscles of the heart around page 370 and 370, all the way through 375. Um, I did not go over those, um, but uh, you can skim through them. For example, cardiac veins, we didn't go over them. Uh, some of the uh, axial images in CT and MRI. I did not go over those. I believe that what I covered here as, as a lecture and in my PowerPoint will be sufficient for you to, first of all, um, go over the quiz and be able to pass the quiz. And also, as far as the information that we need as technologists, I think this is plenty. You're more than welcome to skim over it, look over it, over the pictures, and get yourself more familiar with. But if I didn't go over the images in those pages, I will not ask you um, on the midterm, on the final, or on the quizzes. Okay, let's go over some of the muscles um, in the chest. Important muscles, pectoralis major is important, which covers the anterior chest wall. Trapezius is a superficial back muscle uh, that is related to the chest also. Subscapularis, which is on the coastal surface of the scapula. Supraspinatus and infraspinatus, and also latissimus dorsi. So all these five muscles, five groups of muscles are important to know. Again, pectoralis major. Uh, you have trapezius, you have subscapularis, supraspinatus, and infraspinatus, and then latissimus dorsi muscle. Um, we will go over some of these other muscles, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, when we talk about shoulder a little bit, but it's good to know them. Uh, know that these five are uh, the important muscle groups of the chest. Okay.
let's so look at some of the pathologies. Before we get into the pathology, which um, uh, I'm hoping that you guys can appreciate this one, let's talk about some of the common in indications of CT. Well, you're going to be looking at um, chest pain. Um, a lot of trauma patients coming in, mediastinal lesions. Um, they will ask you for CT of the chest. And also aneurysms and dissections will require you to do a CT. Now this one is actually a CT um, uh, aortic dissection that's really, um, uh, you can see it right here. So aorta has been dissected. So there are two conditions that can happen. Aneurysm, which means uh, there's a dilation of the aortic uh, artery. Aortic artery has been dilated, has become bigger than normal, two or three centimeters that it's supposed to be, and it's gotten a lot bigger. Uh, sometimes aneurysms are um, very noticeable on CTs and you can detect it. Aneurysms can actually become uh, dissections, which means there's a separation between the two parts of the aorta. There's actually a wall that separates uh, the lumen of the aorta. This one is also a, an aortic dissection, uh, which is looking at, see how this is separated? This is all aortic dissection, and it's not just one section, it's a huge big section of the aorta that has dissection. These kind of patients need to go to surgery right away, and and if they don't, the patient can die. This, I think, um, I wanted to put those in um, just for you to look at the chest x-rays, that some of the chest x-rays that are done, and, and you're looking at, for example, this one is a pleural effusion. You can't really see the left lung um, very well. Um, some of the other uh, pathologies that are out there, um, for example, silicose mining, sandblasting. Silicosis is another um, common indication, not very common, but is a, is a common is an indication of the CT chest. These are pulmonary diseases. Um, silicosis is basically caused by inhalation of the silico silicon dioxide that's found in the sand. So if they, you have a worker who's doing sandblasting, their lungs could turn out to be like this. Asbestosis is another one. Uh, it, this is caused by inhalation of the asbestos fibers. It's not very common, but you can still see some out there. So uh, the left one is the chest x-ray of the person with, with asbestosis, and then the right one is the um, chest CT of the same person with all these um, calcifications around the, the lungs. Pulmonary metastases, another indication of the chest CT. Um, the patient uh, might have had uh, another type of a cancer that metastasized into the lungs, which this one is really, uh, really looks bad, and usually prognosis for the lung um, cancer is not very good. Let's talk about cardiovascular MRI just a little bit. Uh, you've been looking at images of MRI, but to actually get an MRI of the chest while the, the chest is moving and while the heart is comp uh, continu continuously moving is very hard. That's why uh, we use a technique called cardiac or physiologic gating. Uh, it is basically required for MRI of the chest. It's a technique that's used to reduce the motion artifact from the heart. We synchronize the, the MRI sequences with the cardiac cycle and usually electrocardiogram or EKG is used um, to monitor the heart uh, movement. Uh, the different planes that we use in cardiovascular MRI are sagittal, coronal, axial, and also oblique. I think we've mentioned this before because of the way the heart is located in the chest and it's kind of an oblique plane. Sometimes we do need to do oblique planes on the structures and heart is one of them. And in fact, your book goes over some of the axial oblique um, images of the uh, MRI images of the heart and you can take a look at those. This is for example a coronal um, image of the um, is a cardiac imaging. 
this is another coronal um, looking at the heart so when you're look when you're doing a chest MRI or cardiac MRI you will have to use a technique where you're uh, making your sequences at the same time as the the heart is relaxing is in a relaxation mode remember systole and diastole so systole is when the heart is moving it, it is um, uh, making it making smaller and then diastole is the relaxation uh, part of the heart systole is when the left side of the heart is pumping blood in, inside the aorta and then diastole is the the stage of relaxation when there's less movement okay and this ends um, my lecture on um, CT and MRI of the chest I hope you enjoyed it thank you